All right, good morning, Byron Nance. Thank you, boys. If, if we have some other kiddos that have instruments, if you can bring those up here, that would be awesome so they're ready for next week. Um, we have a couple of quick announcements before I get into it. So, Joe, you can come up and Lisa? Christina. Oh, Christina, is she here? Oh, I'm sorry, I'm blind. <laughs> Okay, most of you know, and it's in the bulletin, that we have Bible study here every Wednesday night at 6.30 downstairs. And uh, you can ask Charlie or some of them here that we keep it to an hour, 6.30, 7 30. We're pretty religious about that. I have a question for you. Uh, what are the Christian virtues listed by Paul in Ephesians 4? We're going to be studying those this coming Wednesday. You might also ask yourself this question, do I, as a Christian, live up to those virtues? You know, Paul instructs us to do that. So think about that a little bit. Ephesians 4, 1 through 16, we studied this week. Hello. Christina, my hair is darker. I look like my mom. I just, yeah, I just thought I'd get that out while I'm in front of y'all. Uh, I'm Christina, 31. Um, my mom is older. I have these very thick glasses now, and my hair is darker. But just in case you were confused, Christina. Today, um, as part of our pastor appreciation, as you know, we're in between worship pastors right now, and so Susie has been filling in and taking her role in a beautiful way. So every day of the year, she's our wonderful pastor's wife, but she's been filling in as a worship pastor. So we thought that we would recognize her during pastor appreciation. As you all know, there's a basket out front for Susie. But additionally, it's also their birthday, so we do have a card for her, and
called Is Young at Heart, and there's a sign-up sheet for that in the, in the foyer as well. Um, the last thing that I have on here um, is The Well. It is a ladies' event. It's Friday night, November the 1st. It is from 7 to 9 p.m., and it is at Central Church in Lenexa, Kansas. If you need more details, please feel free to contact Susie. I didn't call you Pastor Susie today. <laughs> so please feel free to contact her. And then there are many, many other things in your worship folder, including um, there is a care card in there. So if you are new with us, if you can complete that, that would help us to know how best to pray for you. And then also on the back, there's a place to put any um, care, any care request you'd like us to pray for as well. And you can also include your praises there. We would like to hear about those as well. So if we could have the ushers come up, that would be great. Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your blessings and how you love us. How you care for us. Father, we pray that you would be with us throughout the rest of the service. May your spirit be present and active in our lives and in the word and in the songs that we sing, Lord. We ask that you would bless this offering. That you would bless the giver as well as those who are not able to give at this point, Lord. Uh, you love us all, no matter where we're at in that space. We ask all these thoughts, these things in your son's name. Amen. Amen. Trust in the Lord always, for the Lord God is the eternal rock. He humbles the proud and brings down the arrogant city. He brings it down to the dust. The poor and the oppressed trample it underfoot, and the needy walk all over it. But for those who are righteous, the way is not steep or rough. You are a God who does what is right, and you smooth out the path ahead of them. Lord, we show our trust in you by obeying your laws. Our heart's desire is to glorify your name.
and worship. He says, you're going to be a champion someday. He says, but just keep in mind that your willpower just ain't enough. He says, no matter how big you are, no, no matter how strong you are, thy will be done. But it takes you first. You have to ask. So, I looked over the past experiences in my life and my willpower just took me to the scene of the crash. But worship will take you to victory. Bow our heads in prayer. We thank you most gracious Heavenly Father for yet another Sunday. Another day to, to call out your name, Heavenly Father. Another day paid dearly for, Heavenly Father, that we won't, we won't take for granted on this day, Heavenly Father. Just exactly what it means. Just exactly what it means to be sitting in your body, the body of Christ, Heavenly Father, on this day. We're all members, Heavenly Father. Just extended members of you on this day, Heavenly Father. But we just ask you to keep that on our hearts that thy will is an awesome thing if we could just make our ways or make our way to you <coughs> just on a day to heaven Father we ask that you just, just touch our soul with every word every, every song as we've, ever, as we've called on you this morning we know you're here every Father we know you're with us, Heavenly Father. And you want to do those things for us. Those things that we ask, Heavenly Father, that we need. So we ask that you just fix us. Just fix us. To be those people. But all today, sir, most of all, be with us. Heal us, Heavenly Father, if some has come for that. Be with us for those, just those tough times today. We're all in need. We all may not, not know all of us, but we just know you're the God that we can call on. And you're there for us on this day, Heavenly Father. So as I say, just fix us and, and just anoint our speaker, our pastor, as you always do. To give him the wisdom and the knowledge to feed us, Heavenly Father. And we just ask him for these many blessings in your son's name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you. 
<clears throat> so thank you for that. This morning I invite you to turn in your Bibles, if you will, to Luke's Gospel, chapter 18. Luke's Gospel, chapter 18, and uh, the first few verses of that chapter. Here we are. So, okay. change your place a little bit. Won't you stand with me in honor of God's word this morning as we read? Luke's Gospel, chapter 18, beginning at verse 1. Then Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. He said, in a certain town there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared what people thought. There was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with the plea, grant me justice against my adversary. For some time he refused, but finally he said to himself, even though I don't fear God or care what people think, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice so that she won't eventually come and attack me. Smart man. <laughs> and the Lord said, Listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God bring about justice for His chosen ones who cry out to Him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Will he? Hmm. May the Lord add his blessing to this, his word this morning. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Shall we recite our motto together once again before we uh, receive it? All together. Heavenly Father, I give you permission to speak to me, to speak through me, to do whatever you want with my life. I trust the leadership of your Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. If you really believe that, you can be seen. <laughs> spies and espionage, then you know that spies live in constant tension of being found out. Right? Spies live in constant tension of being found out. Because spies are holding their true identity and purpose. They're, they're hiding their true identity and purpose. That even the tiniest false move could blow their cover and put them in danger. That kind of premise guarantees that a spy story or a movie will be filled with tension and excitement. It makes it interesting. It keeps your, your attention, for sure. One of the most famous true spies of modern times was a Spanish man by the name of Juan Pujol Garcia. At the start of World War II, Garcia approached the British intelligence agents in Spain and offered his services as a spy for the British government. Garcia was a great man who cared very deeply about defeating the Nazis, but the British government kept turning him down, kept turning down his offers of help. And so Juan Pujol Garcia decided to defeat the Nazis in an entirely different way. He approached the German intelligence agents in Spain and pretended to be a fanatical Nazi sympathizer. And he offered to spy against the British. Huh. The Nazi jumped on that, hired him immediately. That was the start of the most brilliant intelligence operation in modern history. Garcia and his handler, Thomas Harris, Tomas, I guess, created hundreds of false reports detailing secret plans of the British troops and fed those plans to the Germans. Garcia's greatest deception was convincing the German military commanders that the invasion of Normandy was not their biggest assault plan in France. He provided intelligence reports that convinced the Germans that a much bigger invasion was planned for a different site. 
in France. So the German commanders believed him and they reserved some of their best forces far away from Normandy. Mm -hmm. So the British government believes that it was this tactic that allowed the Allies to succeed against German forces on D-Day in Normandy. Garcia was such a successful double agent that he's the only known person to have been awarded the highest military honors from both German and British governments. <laughs> Can you imagine? Very interesting. Now for those of us who aren't world famous spies, <laughs> The danger in living between two worlds is that we might forget our true identity, right? We just might, that's the danger of us living in two worlds. We just might forget our true identity. Well, Jesus knew that this was a very real danger for his followers. Jesus knew that. Knew it was a danger. So, there's three things for us to consider today. Number one. Jesus knew that his followers live in the tension between two worlds. He knew that. He knew that about his followers, his disciples. Then he knows that about us today. That, that we live in the tension between two worlds. It's true. And may I remind you that the Bible says that our citizenship is now in heaven. Our citizenship is now in heaven. This world, you know the song, this world is not my home, I'm just a passenger. That's the way it goes. And it's true. That we're citizens of heaven. And our values and priorities and relationships now reflect the character and the values of God. You say, well, I, I think I understand that. But our bodies are still living in this world. A world that's full of sin. A, a world that, in which people neither fear God nor care about anybody else but themselves. Right? Anybody know the name Walter Payton? <laughs> I, I, look, I know a few I know, know the name very well. And probably Tom and Timmy can probably recite me all of his, uh, his, his numbers, right? But Walter Payton played 13 years as a running back for the Chicago Bears football team in the NFL. And during his career, he rushed for 16,726 yards. <clears throat> Sounds impressive, doesn't it? I get off to. That's a lot of running. That's over nine miles of worth of rushing yards. And you know what makes it even more impressive? He achieved that record, 16,726 yards, with somebody knocking him down every four and a half yards. And knocking him down pretty hard sometimes. That's what makes that record impressive. I, I relate that because Jesus knew that his followers we're going to get knocked down over and over again. He knew that. That's just the way the world is, right? It's neither whether you're right or wrong. It just happens to us. Hard, the, the school of hard knocks, right? You say. We go through a lot of things. And so, Jesus knowing that, how in the world could He convince them, His followers, to get back up and keep running. How, how can he convince them of that? So he told them this parable to show them that they should always pray and never give up. This parable. Now, this passage today is about the persistent widow and the unjust judge. And it's actually part of a larger teaching that's all about the kingdom of God. And to understand this story in Luke chapter 18, we actually have to go back to the end of Luke chapter 17 to figure it out. Because if you look at Luke chapter 17 from verse 20 down to the end of the, of the chapter, verse 37, 
Jesus warns his followers that the kingdom of God is coming and that they need to be prepared because you never know when it's going to happen. And you need to be prepared because most people won't be ready for it when it happens. And he goes through a list of scenarios in here in Luke 17 about the... Um, just as in the days of Noah, so will it be in the days of the Son of Man. People were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage up to the day Noah entered the ark. And then came the flood and destroyed them all. He tells several scenarios about one will be doing this and the Son of Man will be coming and somebody's going to be missing. It just happens. It's going to be right there. So he's trying to explain to us that and, and us today, as we look at it, that we will be in the middle of our ordinary lives. Doing your ordinary routine things of life. Whatever it is. And the kingdom of God will just appear. It will happen. It's, gonna happen. it's just going to suddenly be here. You won't know when it happens until it happens. Then it might be too late. <clears throat> and then we get to Luke chapter 18. After he, after he goes through all those scenarios telling us that. And then Luke 18, he begins, Then Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and never give up. <clears throat> and he tells them this parable. And the parable is about a poor widow. Now, in Jesus' day, you remember that widows had nothing. If their family or their community didn't watch out for them, then they were in trouble. The very word widow in the Hebrew literally means one who is silent. One who is silent. That's what the word literally means. Widows didn't have a voice in their society. And this widow was in trouble. She, she has been wronged and she goes to the courts to ask for justice. But the judge is heartless. It's corrupt. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? Sounds too close. In fact, this judge, not only is he heartless and corrupt, he says he doesn't even care. He doesn't care about God or man. No morality, no compassion. This judge is a good example of our fallen world. He's an example of our fallen world. Our world doesn't respect God or show much compassion for the weak and the needy, really. And this corrupt judge has all the power over this needy woman's life. Holds all the power. And here's this poor widow. And this widow is a picture of all of those believers who are holding on to their faith in a corrupt and unjust world. Who are praying to know God's will. To hear God's voice. Who are praying for mercy and just enough grace to get through another day. The widow is the representation of all those believers holding on to their faith in a corrupt world. And Jesus is saying, don't stop praying. Don't stop believing that God can and will give you justice. Don't give up on the kingdom of God because it's coming. No matter how bad things look right now. God will redeem this world back to Himself. His kingdom will come again. That's what Jesus is saying. Kind of remind you, even when you think you're all alone, when you're all by yourself and you're doing, you're the only one standing for truth. You're the only one standing for right. And sometimes it feels that way, doesn't it? Kind of reminds me, back in 1979, an Indian, East Indian teenager named Jadav Paying began planting trees on a small island in Assam, India. Jadal saw how deforestation had killed off so much animal life on the island and he, he had a vision. He had a vision of a lush green ecosystem where animals could thrive. 
And so at the age of 16, he planted his first trees along the edge of the island. And he tried so hard to get the government's help. Tried so hard to get other agencies to help. But he couldn't get the local government. He couldn't get other citizens of his town interested in his project. They didn't see his vision. And they didn't care about the condition of the island. And so for the next 30 years, this young man, Jadal Payne, continued his work all by himself, one tree at a time. Today, the area Jadav tended to is called the Malaya Forest. And it's full of trees and plants and flowers. And it's home to tigers and elephants and rhinos and monkeys and deers and rabbits. <laughs> Jadav Payne looked at a barren, sandy stretch of island and he saw a lush, green, forest full of life. No one else saw his vision. No one else encouraged him. But he persisted until his vision became a reality. I correlate this back to our story where Jesus is talking because Jesus himself spent most of his ministry creating a vision of the kingdom of God. Spent most of his ministry creating a vision of the kingdom of God. And more than anything, he wanted people to understand who God is and what God's original plan for creation was. And he wanted them to understand that no matter how corrupt or unjust this world can be, that he would come back as Messiah someday and establish the kingdom of God. God's vision for this world. So even when it seemed like we're all alone, that we're the only ones standing for right and truth. How do we fight off frustration and weariness in the meantime? How do we, how do we fight off frustration and weariness? First of all, Jesus commands us to pray. Amen. Pray. That's, that's it. Pray. And that leads me to the second thing. That prayer is the bridge between this sinful world and the kingdom of God. Prayer is the bridge. Right. That's it. As the Union Pacific Railroad was being constructed in the West, an elaborate trestle bridge was built across the large canyon. And wanting to test the bridge, the builder of the bridge loaded a train with extra cars and equipment to double its normal payload. The train was then driven to the middle of the bridge where it stayed an entire day. Just left it out there. So one worker came up to him and said, Are you trying to break this bridge? He said, no, this is the builder. He said, no, he said, I'm trying to prove that the bridge won't break. Mm. Back in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 6, Jesus says that God knows what we need before we even ask. God knows what we need before we even ask. So, what's the purpose of prayer? Right? If God already knows before we even ask, then why don't He just take care of it? Why do we have to? What's the purpose of prayer? Why do we have to come and ask? Hmm. I'm glad you asked that question. I have some possible answers for us. <laughs> Prayer puts us in the presence of God. Prayer puts us in the presence of God. And another thing, prayer may or may not change our circumstances, but it changes us. 
It may or may not change our circumstances, but it changes us, or it changes the way we look at it, or the way we perceive things. It changes us. Prayer. Prayer helps us to see the world, to think about the world, to respond to this world the way that God would. And how do we know how God would unless we pray? And be in the presence of God. And learn from God. Pay attention to His voice. Each of us. Prayer gives us the strength and the wisdom of the Holy Spirit. A strength and wisdom that, that give us an eternal perspective on our current circumstances. Sometimes, you know, we're too close to something to be able close to the trouble or you can't see the forest because of the trees or the trees because of the forest, however that saying goes. Prayer gives us strength and wisdom of the Holy Spirit. And it gives us that strength and wisdom as a, of the eternal perspective on our situations. And I have to say, add this, that persistent prayer Reminds us that God is working in this world whether we see the results or not. Persistent prayer reminds us that God is still working in this world whether we see the results or not. Because you see, prayer is the tool that God gave us to set us free from the values and the priorities and the powers of this world. Prayer is that <clears throat> and we need to use it often. So this poor widow in our parable had no power against the unjust judge, but she wasn't afraid. She wasn't afraid to demand the justice that she was due. She wasn't afraid to stand up to his apathy and his corruption. Her faith in a just God gave her the courage and determination to persevere. And she kept that. So it leads me to number three. We too can persist in prayer because we have a God who keeps His promises. We too can persist in prayer because we have a God who keeps His promises. And God promises that we will see justice and mercy when Jesus returns to establish the kingdom of God here on earth. We will see justice and mercy when He comes. So, what about our poor widow here in our story? Jesus notes that she kept coming back day after day. She kept demanding justice until her persistence wore the judge out. Just all the time. Look, look what it says verse 4 and 5 here in Luke 18. The judge, even though I don't fear God or care what people think, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice so that she won't eventually come and attack. <laughs> it's interesting yet because this widow keeps bothering me the Greek verb here he uses here is hypopazio it's a boxing term and it means to strike someone with a full blow to the eye striking someone with a full blow in the eye this, this widow has no power whatsoever in her society. But she has faith in the Almighty God. She refuses to give up. And her faith is so powerful, it's like a punch in the eye to that corrupt judge. And even though he has all the power, as the, as the world measures power, he is powerless in the face of a woman of God. <laughs> uh, amazing. 
She refuses to give up. Reverend Ron Holmes tells of a, about a young missionary who felt God calling him to minister to China during World War II. He, he went to a missionary training school to learn the language and the culture of China. He spent three years in intensive preparation for this ministry. But at the end of his training period, the Communist Revolution broke out in China and those Christian missionaries who were still in the country were either killed or forced to escape the country as fast as possible. And no one was allowed to return back. This missionary who had trained so hard to reach the Chinese people was now denied entry into the country. So he went back to school and he trained to reach the people of South Korea instead. And he spent 25 years as a missionary in South Korea, but in all that time he never lost his passion for China. And he prayed regularly for the people in China. He, he begged God to open up Chinese society to Christian missionaries. He, he kept... Um, he kept correspondence to some. He tried to keep his contact as connected as he could. And he wept over all those people in China who would never get to hear of their Savior, Jesus Christ. And he prayed and he prayed. But after President Richard Nixon visited China in 1972, the country began to open up its borders to more tourists from the outside world. And this devoted missionary was finally able to visit China, but only as a tourist, not as a missionary. And what he found there absolutely amazed him. The underground church in China was flourishing. The persecution by the communist government had not destroyed the Christian church. Instead, it had inspired believers there to share their faith with those with boldness, more boldness. There were now thousands more Christians in China than there had been before the Communist Revolution. And even today, there are more in a, in a communist country, there are more Christians in China than members of the Communist Party. Amen. Wow, that's great. <laughs> Here, one young man. One young man just pray. Spent all that time trying to get there. Was denied to be able to go there. But he kept it. He didn't give up. He kept praying. The bridge. We're living. We're living between a world of righteousness, peace, and joy. And a world of injustice, Sin and suffering. That's where we live. The world between righteousness and peace and joy and the world of injustice and sin and suffering. And the only thing that keeps us going is the certainty of God's faithfulness and the certainty of God's love. The only thing that keeps us going so how do we keep from giving up? Pray. Yes. How do we keep from giving up? We pray. Yes. And God promises that our faithfulness will be rewarded. Amen. Our faithfulness will be rewarded. And what is the reward? We will have the power to endure now and the joy of seeing justice and restoration when His kingdom comes. So if we stay at it, God always honors those who honor Him. And if you stay at it, truth will always win. Amen. You say, well, it doesn't feel that way right now. I understand. I understand. I, I live in the same world. When, when things don't seem to add up, things don't seem to make sense, that God sometimes seems to forget about us, but He hasn't. May we not give up. We ought always to pray and not give up. So let's stay at the task of prayer. Let's never 
give up. Amen? Are you with me? Yes, yes. Too many times, just when God may be ready to do His most miraculous work, we tend to give up because we haven't seen any results up to now. And we want to give up right when God is ready to do His most miraculous work. So let's keep holding on. Keep, keep the faith. Keep praying. God is at work. Even though we can't see all that He's doing now, He is at work. He does care about you and about me. He cares about our loved ones. He cares about this world and what's happening in it. He knows exactly what He's doing. We can trust Him. Amen? So let's trust His plan. Let's trust His plan. Not mine, not yours. His plan. Can you? Yes. Do you? Yes. Ouch. Well, <coughs> He told us this so that we, we might always pray and never give up. He sees you. He knows. And I'm glad He's keeping the record. Aren't you? I'm glad he's keeping the record. Let's pray. Father God, thank you. Thank you for your goodness to us, Lord. And as we turn to you, Lord God, once again, you, you know we've been here many times before. And too often, though, we, we lose interest in prayer. We do. And, and we tend to give up. Or maybe we just go through the motions of prayer. We don't really do it intently. Forgive us, Lord. And I just want to thank you, God, for inviting us to live in covenant with you and one another and for remaining faithful to your promise. And yet, like people of all ages, we, we, find it, we find it difficult to be faithful to you. We despise those who remind us of your call. We, we grieve you by our own rebellion against your word and our slowness to be your partners in this ministry. We're, we're not worthy, God, but, but we pray, don't give up on us. We know you won't. And help us to share with you at your table of joy and welcome all your friends as our friends through Christ, your word of love. And so God, as we're reminded by your word today, as we worship you, I pray that you would lead us into life in all of its fullness and help us to worship with all we are and have and let our laughter and our be instruments of prayer. Lord, help us to be faithful at that task. For, oh God, who is love, when you seem so far away from us, remind us to reach within to the fountain of feelings at, at the core of ourselves, and there let us find you. And when you seem so unconcerned, so massive, so impassive, so insulated by your power, so distant by your expansiveness, remind us to reach out to the hand of a child or to the face of a friend and there let us find you. And in times when we have nothing to feel and there's no one to touch, let us never close our hearts or our hands. But always let us be open to you. Let us be open today. Here and now. And for the days ahead of us. We know that you will always be faithful. So I ask you to help us be faithful. And may we never, ever, 
Jesus' name. Amen. Pastor. Yes, ma'am. Can't help it. <laughs> Help yourself. Right off the bat, about a widow who wouldn't be quiet. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> okay. So here I am with a new experience, listening to the Lord all week long in my Bible study, prayer, prayer, prayer. I picked up one of our Holiness Today magazines. I read through it, and every article was how every church grew was prayer. Prayer. Everyone began with prayer. 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 My heart cries out for prayer for our church. How I love, would love to see us meet together and pray. I remember when I was a little girl, I didn't go to school, the ladies' prayer, mate, ladies prayer band, it was called. I was bored to death and I wanted to tie their shoestrings together when they were on my knees. But I didn't do it because I knew they know I did it. But anyhow, all through my life, I have grown up with prayer, prayer, prayer. Now some weeks ago, I asked prayer for the Jehovah's Witness and we're making some progress. They're being deceitful because they're not on the calendar anymore. But what they have done is to make it look like we are, it's something in our schedule for the, um, uh, those of us that live there to come to at 8 o'clock 9 45 for fun and games that's what they have now and uh it's not, that's gonna be over at the end of the month because i'm gonna see to it but uh, <laughs> one dear little lady went up there you know she's a new resident and she went up to have fun and games because she thought it was part of our activities and when I told her, uh, and kindly, that what she was getting involved in, the poor woman, I thought she was going to um, faint because she says, I don't want to be part of that. I said, I know you don't, and that's why I've come to you, and several others are joining me. It's been a slow process, but I think we're making progress. Mm -hmm. But I'm just saying all this to say, I would love to see us all crash our heads together, get on our knees here in this church, and pray. I think we're overfed, excuse me, for saying that. But there's, your words are so good, your words are so true. And we go and we leave. Oh, how I'd love to see an old fashioned prayer meeting. I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that, sir. Oh, we can take those words to heart. Amen. Stand with me and receive the benediction this morning. My brothers and sisters in Christ, what a joy and privilege it's been to be able to worship together with our family. Thank you. And now I, I pray that as we go from this place, the service actually begins. And may you know that whatever circumstance you find yourself in this week, maybe it's a continuation, maybe it's something new that will pop up. <coughs> know that God knows where you are. He knows what it is. He wants you to come before Him. Don't be afraid. Amen. Keep asking. Stay at it. Keep the faith. Keep praying. He's the one that has the answers. And as we go, He goes with us. And may the peace of Christ be with you all. Amen.
over to you. Thank you. You are dismissed.